Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David, and I'm the pastor here, and we are studying the book of Romans, when we are now at Romans chapter 13. And I'm gonna be honest with you, out of all the chapters in Romans, this is the one that I was the least excited about, because it's the passage that everyone is gonna have a very strong opinion about, and very strong emotions about, particularly uh, because of the climate that our nation is in right now. Maybe not here at our church, but I think surely with your friends and family. Because on the surface, Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, seems pretty clear, okay? And we will, of course, read it, and uh, we'll go through it and study it. But, you know, just in a nutshell, it says we need to be good citizens. We need to live and obey the laws of the country and we should be law-abiding and should be productive. And Paul doesn't offer a lot of wiggle room here. It's pretty cut and dry. But are we to do this all uh, and and never question? You know, should we just blindly obey authority and uh, never complain no matter how bad it gets? In other words, when is it permitted to push back a little? When is it permitted to rebel against a human government? That's going to be a challenge today as we look at God's word. And since this could be a hot button issue for some, I just wanted to go over a couple of things first. Um, One, when you're at a church, you're with your family. And I hope you believe that because I think even with your families at home, you know that families disagree sometimes disagree passionately, disagree loudly, but in the end, we're still family. And as a church, uh, we, sh- we share life together. So even if you disagree with me or you disagree with somebody else, just remember that we're a family. We love each other. Uh, second, we let the Bible interpret the Bible. What does that mean? It means when we read the Bible, we allow the Bible to be our teacher because it is God's word. But if there is something that we don't understand, then we push it back through the filter of the Bible. We use the lens of the Bible to interpret the Bible. We turn to other pages within the Bible to clarify, okay? So let's dig in. Romans chapter 13, verses one through five. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only and avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience." So tell me something. Did you ever wonder where the chapter and verses came from in the Bible? <laughs> They're indispensable to us today. I mean, can you imagine me standing up here on a Sunday morning and I said, hey, can everybody turn to that, that one part in the, in the book of Romans where Paul is talking about being submissive to authority? You know, it's like 60%, 65% uh, into the book. Yeah, I just... I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Well, originally, our ancient manuscripts, they didn't even have punctuation. They didn't even have paragraph markers. So later, scribes began to make chapter divisions around the fourth century. But the chapters in translations of the New Testament that we use go all the way back to the beginnings of the 13th century, when a lecturer at the University of Paris named Stephen Langston introduced them to the Latin Bible. Verse divisions came three centuries after that, in 1551. We have a Paris printer named Robert Stephanus. He published a Greek and Latin edition of the New Testament in which chapter uh, was divided into separate verses. And these are the same ones we use today. They first appeared in the English translation, get this, in 1560 in the Geneva Bible. So there's a story, it's probably, it could be a myth. Uh, Robert Stephanus made these verse notations, they say, while on horseback, from Paris to Lyon. And at first, people thought 
what that meant was that Robert took the text along with him, and then probably at night, during his layovers at inns along the way, he made his notations. But some observers have noticed that right in the middle of a sentence, they, there is a verse number. And so they suggested that Robert must have literally done this on horseback, so that whenever his steed hit a pothole, it caused the slip of his pen. Funny. <laughs> But there is some truth because the problem with chapter and verse markings is sometimes they're not placed very well. Very often they separate a train of thought or a similar idea uh, uh, from a bigger idea. And this is kind of the case in Romans 13 because Romans 13, particularly the first several verses, are this continuation of what we just read in Romans 12. They're not two separate chapters, you know? Last Sunday we read, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what do those two things have in common? Like, Why does it matter that 13 is a continuation of 12? Well, because this concept in chapter 13 about submitting to an earthly authority is a continuation of this idea that we are to be a living sacrifice. You know, everything we learned last week is still on the table as we look at 13. I said last week that our lifestyle should be one of worship, where we give ourselves fully to God in everything we say and do. You know, we said how we think and act should be different, should be holy compared to the rest of the world. And that includes who we are as citizens. Our goal should not be to look like, talk like, and think like everybody else. So what do we see here? Verse 1 says, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That means human government is ordained by God. Ideally, governments are assembled for the good and the welfare of the people. Our government is a constitutional representative republic. Uh, As our constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Our founding fathers were wise in creating a document that defined a system of government that limited a government's power to these very specific categories. Now, obviously, we have seen some serious abuses of this in our lifetimes. We can talk about that. But the principle that God is trying to let us know here is that part of our act of worship is to be obedient to government. Why? To be a good witness. Don't we think that Christians should be the best citizens in the nation? I do. I think so. We see an example of this in Jeremiah 29. You know, the people of Israel and Judah, they are brutally conquered. They're forced out of their homes. They're taken 700 miles away to Babylon. Babylon is ruled by a king who thinks he's a god. And it's pagan and evil in every way. And yet, God gives them this instruction. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Babylon is nothing like where the Hebrews had came from. They are now a conquered people, and they're never going to leave. So what does God tell them to do? He says, be good citizens. Wow. Even in a pagan country where the king declares himself to be a god, he doesn't tell them, you know what you guys should do? You guys should fight back. You guys should rebel. You should take back your homeland. No. 
He says, get married and build homes. And more importantly, he says, seek the welfare of the city. What else does God say in Romans? If the authority and power is placed there by God, then he says, obey that authority. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll confess right now, I have a lead foot. On long trips to my sister's house in Dallas or when my family goes on vacation, if Joanna is looking down or if she's falling asleep, her car can magically start going 90 miles per hour. Have I got a speeding ticket before? I think, I think, you know, (laughs) yeah, I have, like two or three. One of them, though, was from coming home late at night after Disneyland closed. I just got off a long shift and it was an hour drive home and so I was listening to music really loud and I was going 90 miles an hour. And of course a cop uh, in LA pulls me over. He's smiling, very friendly. And he started by saying, you know, I was, I, I, I was looking in my rearview mirror and I saw you coming up on me and I was really sure that you were gonna slow down once you passed me, but you didn't. I was like, yeah, I didn't even see you. And I said, I'm sorry a lot. And I said, yes, sir, a lot. And I nodded and smiled and agreed with everything he said. And you know what? He wrote me a ticket for 75 miles per hour so that I wouldn't get in too much trouble. Now, can you imagine that if it was late at night and I was tired and the cop pulls me over, that I just threw my door open, got out and started yelling at the cop? What would have happened? Things would have gone very differently. Another time I was coming home from a job interview and two squad cars and a motorcycle cop pulled me over with guns drawn. I was handcuffed, I was put in the back of a sheriff's car. And no, I wasn't speeding this time. And I knew my muffler was very loud, but I was pretty sure that wasn't it. Uh, Turned out they made a mistake and they apologized. But I was calm through the entire thing. I smiled, I was helpful, I answered questions. I knew they were wrong, but I didn't yell, I didn't curse them out. I didn't call them names. I didn't ask for their badge numbers. I didn't threaten to sue them. Look at verse three and four. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. You know, in some of our cities and in some of our counties, would you say that probably our police would be better off if they had more training? Probably, Um, you know, absolutely. But, But even more so, I think, you know what? It first starts with our citizens. I think as a country, we need better training to respect our men and women in law enforcement. By the way, Do you know where the idea of the badge came from? It's from the Middle Ages. Kings would appoint the best men in the kingdom to be a knight. And the knight's job was to protect the villagers and to to promote the king's justice. The badge represents a shield that the knight carries. There was a Ridley Scott movie about knights in 2005 called Kingdom of Heaven. And in the movie, you see the knights take an oath And they say, be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be strong and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death and safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. The Knights, they were the precursors to our modern day police force. This is what the shield is supposed to represent. They are worthy of our respect and should honor them, especially those that do their jobs well. Are there bad police? Sure, there are some bullies out there with a badge. They like to throw their weight around. But the same could be said about any job. There are bad waitresses. There are bad lawyers. There are bad auto mechanics. All right, so what about the rest of human government? Well, the Bible says they should be in our prayers. I know many of you would rather have your eyes gouged out than pray for a governor or a president that you didn't vote for. And others of you would rather crawl through broken glass than pray for our U.S. representatives or our men and women in Congress. But how did it get that way? Is anybody perfect? No. As Romans states, we are all sinners. And each person on this earth 
regardless of their personal faith, was created in the image of God, and Jesus died for them. So we should make it a priority to pray for those who lead our nation. We have actually been commanded to do that. We need to pray for them to have the wisdom in their decision-making, that they make those decisions that affect our lives. We need to be praying for morality and issues that are close to the Christian heart. Prayer changes things. Whether we agree or disagree with someone's political agenda, we have a command to pray for them. I believe we need to have times when we pray for our nation, pray for its leaders. We have, we have no right to grumble and complain if we don't pray for the people who lead. Everyone is worthy of our prayers. 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's the principle. Be obedient to the authority God has placed in your life and pray for them. That's true in the home with your parents and caregivers. That is true in this community. That is true in, at work and school. We pray for our teachers and principals. That's true in church. We pray for our pastors. That's true for our nation. And Paul sums up this idea in verse 6 and 7. He says, For because of this you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Have you paid your taxes yet? <laughs> it's April 15th. You got, you got plenty of time, right? But this is part of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Oh, okay, Pastor David, but what about a corrupt government? Like, what about an unlawful order? What then? Okay. Remember we said the Bible interprets the Bible? Keep in mind that as we are writing Romans, who is Paul thinking about when he thinks about the governing authorities? Who is the governing authority at the time Paul writes this? He's writing to Christians in Rome where a man named Nero is emperor. You know, after 2,000 years, people still know this guy's name. He reigned from AD 54 to 68. He's remembered as a monster and a sadist. And the crimes attached to his name are bone chilling. There were rumors that he burned down the capital city, rumors that he slept with his own mother. We know he murdered his relatives. That's just the short list. Nero is throwing Christians into the Colosseum to be torn apart by wild animals to be killed by gladiators. Emperor Nero dips Christians in oil and then impales them on large spikes and sets them on fire so that they can become candles to light the city streets. Is he a godly man? Not at all. Nero rose to power by convincing his mom to kill his dad, and then he kills his mom. This is the person in ultimate authority during much of Paul's writings. And Paul still says, be submissive. Be salt and light where you can. This is the person who's in charge when Paul writes, live peaceably with everyone. He writes in 2 Peter, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. So where can we rebel against the authorities? In fact, you know, we, if you want to, you know, think about it, we wouldn't even have an America if some small group didn't rebel, if we didn't have some intrepid pioneers that rebelled. That's true. I wish I could give you a set criteria list of when it's a good time, but, you know, it's going to be so subjective. I think, let, let me give you an example from history. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor. He lived in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, and he witnessed firsthand the rise of Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler. He was one of the very first Christian leaders in his nation who spiritually understood 
who Adolf Hitler really was. And immediately after Hitler was elected to be Chancellor of Germany, Bonhoeffer gave a radio address where he, as one of the well, most well-known prominent pastors in his nation, I mean, he's like Billy Graham to them, he warned the German people about falling off into this cult and worshiping the Fuhrer. Hitler immediately forced the German church to elect new leadership that supported him. He was trying to silence Bonhoeffer. That just made Bonhoeffer more vocal and eventually uh, he was arrested and sent to prison. Bonhoeffer was accused of associating with the July 20th plot to assassinate him and Bonhoeffer was tried along with those men and women and he was hanged. April 9th, 1945, five months before World War II ended. Did Dietrich Bonhoeffer do the right thing? Most people say he did. But even as you consider your answer, think about that we have stories in the Bible where people did rebel against authority. You know, Exodus chapter one, the Egyptian midwives, they hid Hebrew babies in order to save them from death. In the same book, Moses rebels against Pharaoh. In 2 Kings, Jehu wipes out King Ahab's entire family. Same book, Jehoiada hid Joash from the queen. In the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the image of gold. In the book of Acts, the disciples are told by Hebrew leadership, stop preaching about Jesus. And they said, we will not obey you. And those are just a few of the examples in biblical history where people refused to obey authority. Now, I know, traditionally, we don't talk about politics and religion in mixed company. I understand, in a group of people our size, we have varying political opinions, but I do not think that it is accurate to say that politics and religion don't mix. In fact, the Bible addresses politics, doesn't it? Government was not an issue when the biblical writers addressed these things. The scriptures talk about the role of government and how we should respond to government. And so much of our laws for our country are taken from the Bible. So I think it's fair to say that Christians should be concerned about politics and that God is concerned about politics. We read 1 Peter 2. It tells us to submit to the governing authority. 1 Timothy 2 urges us to pray for those who lead. So saying that religion and politics do not mix is usually just an excuse for people so they don't have to feel uncomfortable. It shouldn't be uncomfortable. We seem to have no issue singing patriotic hymns in church, and we don't mind politics and religion mixing in this building. So why can't they mix at home? Or when we talk about elections and the issues, I believe that it's important that Christians be involved in the process. We should be concerned about the election and all the current issues. We should be concerned about who is leading us because they decide what freedoms we have and what freedoms we don't and what rights we have and what rights we don't. But just how do we as Christians interact with government? What does the Bible say about issues that relate to this? I believe that in a critical time in history of our country, it's important to be informed and to see what our biblical responsibility is with the government and not to simply just withdraw ourselves from the conversation. So far, we've seen that our leaders were placed in their jobs by God The Bible says to submit to their authority. The Bible says to pray for them. So how do we interact together? And how involved should Christians be in this government process? Because we always hear about the separation of church and state, right? There's a lot of talk in the world about the separation of church and state. We see these, this is a hot issue that's debated and courts are voting to remove the Ten Commandments from courthouses and public places. Courts have removed public prayer from schools, there's been talk about removing the words under God from the Pledge of Allegiance, and there's been talk about removing the phrase in God we trust from our currency. And that is all done under this banner of keeping church and state separate. And honestly, I'm all for 
the separation of church and state. The reason came about to protect the church, though, from the state, imposing it, not a fear of the church imposing on the state. But because more and more Christians are excusing themselves from the conversation, what we're seeing now is even more evidence of a nation that is more and more actively moving away from God and from Christian principles. So the best thing we can do in regard to this is to be a source of change on the state, not through violent protests and not even by lobbying for our opinions. How then? By changing people's hearts through the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. Christians, if we can affect individuals one by one, then the laws will change one by one. I believe one reason why the commandments are not tolerated and God is not a word that can be spoken is because the church is not doing its job to be salt and light. The primary responsibility we have to our nation and our government is to show Christ, to show his love and grace. And then through that change, culture changes. And when cultures change, the laws change. How else can we change the world? By voting. Vote. Leviticus 5 says, if anyone sins, in that he hears a public adjuration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. All too often we sit around and complain about the issues, but we don't vote. We cannot complain if we don't vote. I would even go so far as to say that I believe God would want us to be involved in the election process, to choose men and women who support biblical values, for instance, in the 2000 presidential election, we had George Bush ran against Al Gore. Now, your favorite candidate may have won, but in that election, they did a survey and discovered three out of five Christians didn't vote. Listen, I don't wanna sit back while God's name is removed from every aspect of culture and have no say in it. So I believe that when we vote, though we as Christians have a duty to vote, we should not be ignorant. We need to take this seriously. We vote for leaders who will have an impact on society. Franklin D. Roosevelt said, nobody will ever deprive the American people of the right to vote, except the American people themselves. And the only way they could do this is by not voting. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison said, not voting is not a protest, it is surrender. In 1883, Allentown, New Jersey, there was a wooden Indian, you know, the kind that used to sit out in front of a cigar store. That was placed on the ballot for justice of the peace. <laughs> the candidate was registered under the fictitious name Abner Robbins. And when the ballots were all counted, Abner won over the incumbent, Sam Davis, by seven votes. A similar thing happened in 1938. The name Boston Curtis appeared on the ballot for Republican committeeman for Wilton, Washington. And actually, Boston Curtis was a mule. The town's mayor sponsored the animal to demonstrate that people know very little about the candidates. And he proved his point because the mule won. Preach the gospel. Vote, and one more. Going back to verse seven. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Honor. It says honor to whom honor is owed. That last area is where we struggle. To give what we owe to the government is out of respect. I know many Christians are guilty, as anyone, of telling jokes about our leaders, jokes about the left or the right. Everyone seems to be doing it. 
when there is a news story about any of our government officials, we tend to think the worst about that person. Jesus was asked about this once. Do you remember what he said? Some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians came to trap Jesus in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. In a very precise way, we are told how to submit to the governing authority by giving what we owe. Paul repeats Jesus' command here in verse 7. And he says, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. And he says, if honor, then honor. A teenager once wrote to Ann Landers, and he said, I'm a 15-year-old, and my biggest problem is my mother. All she does is nag, nag, nag from morning till night. Turn off the TV, do your homework, wash behind your neck, stand up straight, go clean your room. How can I get her off my case? And he signed it, pick, pick, pick. Anne wrote back, dear picky, here's how. Turn off the TV, do your homework, wash behind your neck, stand up straight, and go clean up your room. In other words, respect and obey your parents. The rest of that verse is in 1 Timothy. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Being subject to authority is a hard thing for some people. But God has instructed us in his word to do it and to pray for them. Paul says it's good and pleasing to God. I think those are some pretty powerful reasons to pray for our government. And remember, we are supposed to pray for our government, not against it. Pray for the president and his cabinet that they make decisions that have national and worldwide implications. Pray for our legislatures, both national and state, that they would pass legislation that reflects biblical priorities. Pray for our state and local governments because they make decisions that affect our day-to-day -day living in our country, in our county, in our city, in our state, in our home. Pray for our government. It leads to peace and it pleases God. So, let's do it right now. Heavenly Father, just as you gave wisdom to Moses to appoint elders among the Israelites, you blessed our founding fathers with the wisdom to divide our country into individual states. You have empowered our governors and state legislatures to make laws and decrees which manage our daily lives and make our lives safe and protect us from overreach. We pray for our governors and our state legislatures. We pray for our House of Representatives, Congress, and our President. Please give strength and wisdom to them and guide their decisions. And may they always put love first. Surround them with people from all walks of life and many backgrounds. Bring to them people of high moral character and spiritual maturity. And among the many voices which cry out to them every day, may they hear your voice above all others. We also pray for our mayors, our city councils, county commissioners, police chiefs, judges, and all who serve our local communities. Strengthen them with wisdom and grace for the heavy burdens they carry. May they manage their teams and projects with love. Keep their hearts pure and their eyes turned toward you as they work in the best interests of all the people they are called to serve. We are grateful to live in a country where we can openly pray for our leaders. And we thank you for each and every blessing. Amen.
Well, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, I would remind you that we have services on Sunday. Uh, we have a 9.30 service, which is traditional. We have a choir, we sing hymns. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer, do responsive readings, have communion. It's gonna feel exactly like the church where you grew up. Of course, after that, at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Please come casual, come however you feel the most comfortable. We also have at that time, a children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we just wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.